Okay, so in this video, I'm going to review momentum and some of the basic ideas that go with momentum. And momentum is actually a relatively simple idea in the sense that there's not a whole lot of equations that go into it. We just have to be very comfortable using it and applying it to different situations. So the, the primary equation we see for momentum, right, for linear momentum, they define, and they do give us this on the equation sheet, that momentum equals mass times velocity. We also know then that a change in momentum would equal mass times a change in velocity. Because assuming that the mass is staying constant, if the momentum's changing, the velocity has to be changing. Or in other words, we could do mass times the final velocity minus mass times the initial velocity, right? So those two equations are, are very similar, obviously, to each other, but it is important we realize that first equation is just identifying the momentum at a single point, whereas the second equation here is identifying the change in momentum over a period of time or as a force is acting on it. A um, couple of key concepts that come along with momentum. It's very important we realize that momentum is a vector, and that has two big consequences for us, right? If it's a vector, the direction matters, right? So if it's a vector, the direction matters. And the, the big consequence there is the fact that that means the sign of momentum matters, and it also means that any angles involved matter a lot as well. So when I look at something with momentum, let's just look at kind of a basic example. Um, and again, this is the type of example where if we truly understand momentum, the, the answers to these questions should be pretty immediate. Um, so if you feel shaky on this stuff, it tells me you need to work on this a little bit. But if I have a ball that's being thrown, let's say I have a ball that's being thrown against a door, and it's a clay ball, so it hits the door and it comes to rest as it hits the door. Right? It just hits the door and it stops. And then let's say I have another ball that's thrown the same velocity, same speed, I should say, so same speed, let's even say the same mass, and it hits the door. And this time this ball is bouncy, and so it bounces backward with the same speed in the opposite direction. Right? If I ask you which of those two experiences a greater change in momentum or impulse, right? and it is worth noting that impulse is simply a change in momentum. So if I ask you which of those two experiences a bigger change in momentum, it's really important that we identify that momentum is a vector. Right. In the first scenario, when we go from mv to 0, right, a lot of students identify that, hey, that definitely is a change, and it's changing by that much, right? mass times velocity. In the second scenario is where we have to be careful. The second situation, it's really a common mistake for students to say, well, I've got mass times velocity, minus I end up with mass times velocity afterwards. Therefore, my change in momentum, because this would be the initial, this would be the final, my change in momentum is zero. And when you look at that, again, at first it jumps out as, okay, that means the change in momentum is zero, so this one changed by less. Here's where we have to be careful. The direction changed. And so even though they don't necessarily identify that in the prompt, we have to realize that if the direction changes, one of these two velocities, one of these two momentums should be negative, right? So instead of something like this, I actually have maybe, and again, I'll do the traditional, my final minus my initial. So let's say that this ends up being positive. That would mean the original velocity is negative. So it's mass times velocity minus mass times negative velocity, which is actually a change of mass times velocity plus mass times velocity, or 2mv. So whereas the first object changed by mass times velocity, this one actually changed twice as much. And again, that's the type of thing where even without proving it. Now, obviously, I mathematically just proved it here. But that's the type of thing we should be able to recognize that almost immediately, right? If something changes direction, it has to experience a much larger change in momentum than something that is simply brought to rest, right? That's got to be the case in order for it to both stop and then change directions as well. So hopefully that, that example is a good one to illustrate kind of the key idea with direction mattering. Another example we've seen before let's say I have two masses. I have one that's initially sliding this way, and the second one that is initially at rest. And then after the collision, the first object, let's say, bounces straight upward, and they ask us, what would object two do? Again, this is one where even without the mathematics, we should be able to identify the situation very quickly, right? Before the collision, momentum of object one was going off to the left, which means we had some horizontal momentum. After the collision, object one ends up going upward, which means we end with some final vertical momentum, right? So then what does object two have to do? Well, in any collision, as long as there's no outside forces, and we'll talk about this more formally in just a minute, 
But as long as there's no outside forces, we know momentum has to be conserved. And therefore, if we had some horizontal momentum to begin with, object two is going to have to carry on at least some of that horizontal momentum as well. And in this case, it's going to carry on all of that horizontal momentum since ball one is simply going upward, right? Since there was no vertical momentum before the collision, the total momentum was zero vertically, then if object one ends up bouncing upward, object two has to go downward to have some horse or excuse me, some vertical momentum that is equal and opposite to the total momentum there or the, the momentum of ball one. And therefore, that's the only way that total momentum can add up to zero. So therefore, we know right now that ball two should be going off at some angle down this way. Now again, mathematically, we can get to proving that, which we'll see in just a minute. But this is the type of situation I should be able to identify right away without having to do any mathematics. And if you feel like you can't do that yet, again, that tells me we probably don't understand momentum as well as we re really need to. So then let's get into the, the big question. So momentum, again, on its own is just mass times the velocity. Really, the foundational question on most of these examples, though, is should momentum be conserved or is momentum going to change? And that really comes down to what's our system and is there an outside force acting on the system? If the outside force, if the net force acting on the system is zero, then we know that momentum should be conserved. So this applies to almost every single collision where we have two objects, as long as we are accounting for both of those objects being the system, right? If both of those objects together are the system, then there shouldn't be any outside forces unless maybe there's friction or gravity acting on those two objects. So if it's just the two objects and no outside forces acting, we know momentum should be conserved. So this leads us to the way that we've seen before where we set it up where we maybe do mass one V one initial plus mass two V two initial. So that would be before the collision. And then assuming that these two bounce back separately, we would simply separate those as M one V one final plus M two V two final. It's an easy enough equation to use if you can correctly set it up. Again, the big question is when do I use this and when do I not, right? And I can only use this relationship if the net force is zero. And if I know for a closed system that the net force is zero, right? We also know then the opposite situation would be what if the net force is not zero? Well, if the net force is not zero, then that tells me momentum should not be conserved, right? So the initial momentum should not equal the final. So in other words, there should be a change in momentum. Well, what's the relationship that we work with then? Well, again, it's actually an easy one to, to use, and it's on the equation sheet for us. That's when we use F delta T equals delta P, right? If there is an outside force that is not zero, then there should be a change in momentum that is also not zero, right? We know the time wouldn't be zero if we were acting for a period of time, right? If this was zero, then wouldn't the change in momentum have to be zero also, which simply tells me the initial equals the final takes us right back to where we started. But again, that's not typically when we're using F delta T equals delta P. So that's the big question you have to ask yourself. Is there an outside force? Is there not an outside force? Right, and what does that look like? We'll come back to this idea in a minute when we look at some of the graphs as well. Um, but hopefully that feels pretty comfortable for most of us to start with. Uh, and then let's get into the types of collisions. So we have a couple different types of collisions we've seen in this class. And again, the, the big thing to realize is that in any of these collisions, momentum should be conserved, no matter what type of collision, momentum should be conserved as long as there are no outside forces. So the type of the collision does not tell me anything about momentum. We are going to assume momentum is conserved as long as we can show that there's no outside forces acting, right? So then what types of collisions do we have? We do have our perfectly inelastic. I think this is the one that a lot of students are pretty comfortable with. Perfectly inelastic is when the two objects stick together, right? So we know that those are the examples where the two objects stick together. So maybe I have something like M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 final, or excuse me, initial, right? So initially they're moving separately, and then after the collision we can do the whole trick where, well, hey, if they're sticking together, they should have a single common velocity, right? So I can group the masses and then take it times the velocity. Again, this tends to be the one that most students feel pretty comfortable with. The other consequence of this is we actually kind of know right now that because it is an inelastic collision, energy should not be conserved, right? So energy is not conserved in inelastic collisions, right? That being said, 
if they asked us to prove or justify that, don't just say that because it's inelastic, it's not conserved. Simply, simply show that the kinetic energy before does not equal the kinetic energy afterwards, right? So find the kinetic energy of the two objects beforehand. So find the kinetic energy of this one, kinetic energy of this one, and then find the total kinetic energy of the two afterwards. And just show if it's either the same or different, and that proves for me that it's inelastic. So again, generically, any collision that does not conserve energy would be inelastic, right? So any collision where kinetic energy or energy as a whole is not conserved. Okay, So that does not mean that just because two objects do not stick together, that does not mean that they're all of a sudden elastic. Most of the time, even if the objects don't stick together, so even if I have something like this where I have two balls and then all of a sudden they bounce backwards, right? that does not mean it's elastic. That simply means we have to check and we have to see if our energy is conserved or not. Usually it's still going to be inelastic, but we need to be able to prove it. And then finally, we do have our third type. So we've got our first two here perfectly inelastic and elast inelastic. And then our third type is elastic collisions, right? So elastic collisions are those where energy is conserved, right? So in, in this case, we know that the total energy before should equal the total energy afterwards. These collisions in the real world are very rare. That does not mean it's impossible. That just means that they don't happen very often, right? But again, the only way that I can know for sure is to go through and prove it by finding the kinetic energy before and afterwards. So these are our three types of collisions. Um, they are obviously very helpful for us to know. The biggest thing, though, that again, we need to be very confident. You got to you got to know 100 percent going in. These only tell me about the energy involved. They do not tell me about the momentum. The momentum should be conserved, right? Momentum is conserved for each of these as long as there's no outside forces, right? So it's conserved with no outside forces. So as long as it's a closed system, momentum is conserved, period. It doesn't matter if it's inelastic, elastic, perfectly inelastic. We need to know that. And again, that's something that should be automatic. If it's not automatic, that means we need to review this. We need to go through it a few more times. Um, but you need to reach that point to where you don't really even have to think about that. You just realize that. Okay, so then let's, let's tie this all together with a couple of graphs that will help us kind of see what we can do with this too. So when we look at our graphs, there's two common types of graphs that you see um, for collisions. Now, it doesn't mean these are the only two graphs, right? You could tie other things with this as well. But if we're looking directly at momentum, one graph would be to graph the momentum versus time. So let's say that I gave you a graph for a single object and I showed you the momentum of that object versus time. So let's say that maybe the momentum of the object gives us some data that looks like that. Well, obviously, if we if we draw a line of best fit, we can see that that data is pretty clearly a uh, pretty straight line, right? It does have a, a slope that is obviously going upward. The first two questions, as always, should be, what does the area and what does the slope of this graph mean? Well, the slope would be the change in momentum over the change in time, which sure enough, if you rearrange F delta T equals delta P, shows me that the slope should be the average force acting on the object. So in other words, if I can calculate the slope of this line, I've just found the slope equals the average force acting on the object. So this shows me then that this graph would have an outside force. This object would have an outside force acting on it, because clearly the momentum is not being conserved. right? And if I want to find that outside force, or if I want to find the net outside for force, Right, so really, truly, this would be the net external force. Then I'm just going to find the slope of that line. So hopefully that kind of helps with this graph. Again, not a whole lot to it. You just have to make sure you ask yourself that question. If you think about the area, the area doesn't really make sense for this graph. We don't really have an equation that's delta P times delta T. So that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in this case. The other common graph is kind of going the other direction. Then what if I give you force versus time? Right, so what if I give you the force versus time and ask you something about that? So maybe I give you a force versus time graph that looks something more or less like this. right? Once again, the first two questions, what's the slope? What's the area? Well, the slope would be change in force over change in time, which again, if you, if you kind of comb through your equation sheet, doesn't really have any direct meaning for us. And in fact, if you break this up, this would be mass times acceleration divided by time. Acceleration 
by time doesn't really have any meaning, right? We don't typically have meters per second cubed. That just isn't something we see very often. So the slope for this graph doesn't necessarily mean anything. However, the area for this graph is very meaningful, right? The area would be my force times my change in time, or in other words, my change in momentum. So if I were to find the area, so if I asked you maybe, hey, what's the change in momentum for the first eight seconds? Then I would simply find the total area bounded by this graph. I would find that area mathematically, and then I would know that that area should be equal to the change in momentum. So in other words, that area should equal the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Right, so we can see a lot with graphs here, right? So we can see the force, we can see the momentum. Now there are a couple ways they could maybe trick us on this a little bit as well. What happens if instead of a momentum versus time graph, what if they gave me a velocity versus time? So maybe my velocity versus time graph looks something like this. Well, if I know that the mass is still constant, then doesn't this graph here look exactly like the graph we saw before? Right? The only thing that's different is momentum is really mass times velocity. So wouldn't I just be taking my velocity, whatever it starts at, and multiplying it by the mass? So that would maybe give me a new starting value, which would be my momentum. But in other words, if I have a velocity versus time graph, it actually can show me the momentum is changing as well. Right? If we look here, the velocity obviously starts down here, ends up here. So I did have a change in velocity, which means I do have a change in momentum as well. So then I could almost treat this like a momentum graph, right? If I just redefined it, I could actually find my momentum versus time graph. And then once again, if I needed to find my force, I could pretty easily find my force. Now that does not mean that's the only way to solve this question. That just means that's another perspective we could take using momentum. Okay, so again, that, that covers most of the nuts and bolts here of momentum. So as we've gone through this video, we've seen that momentum is a vector. Very important that we realize the direction matters, right? If an object goes, if a five kilogram object goes from 10 meters per second this way to negative five meters per second that way, and I ask you what's the impulse or the change in momentum, right? And that is something to worth note, noting as well, the impulse, right? Change in momentum. But if I'm trying to find the change in momentum, I need to make sure I'm accounting for the fact that this is negative. So I'm going five times negative five minus five times positive 10, right? And that would represent my total change in momentum. So little things like that, we have to watch out for momentum's a vector. Momentum is conserved as long as there's no net external force. Momentum is not conserved if there is an external force, in which case we just use F delta T equals delta P, right? And then finally, we have the types of collisions, elastic, perfectly inelastic, and um, inelastic in general. And we need to realize that for each of those equations, momentum is still conserved. It's simply the energy that we are not sure about until we can prove it. All right. So hopefully that helps you with momentum. Again, the, the bottom line, until we actually start to practice this stuff more and more, you just won't know exactly where you're at. So hopefully as we do these examples, we feel like we're pretty good. But if not, come back and review this video again.